Welcome to Geology 2017. This is the fourth lab and it's dedicated uh, to sedimentary rocks. So we are going to examine a few things that concern uh, sedimentary rocks really and mostly focus uh, on two key aspects. So one, are, um, one is the grain size of sedimentary rocks so grain size variations uh, and then we are going to discuss uh, about the classification of sedimentary rocks uh, and also uh, I was forgetting the uh, composition so really important uh, to classify sedimentary rocks uh, we need uh, to understand the different compositional variations in sedimentary rocks. So it's a combination of grain size and also composition. And this is very similar in a way, and in fact there, there are parallels between uh, the classification of sedimentary rocks and also the classification of effusive products, so the ejecta that we discussed when we were treating the igneous rocks, uh, so when we talk about uh, pyrocla pyroclastic flows, uh, for, for instance, you, you might remember that at some stage we had uh, uh, reworking of pyroclastics and, and uh, uh, a cent a certain types of cl classifications were dealing with uh, uh, grey wakes, uh, were dealing with conglomerates, uh, and these where this is more terminology that is really used for sedimentary rocks, but in some circumstances, if you are uh, re-depositing and reworking volcanic products, uh, you actually get a similar type of depositional setting and depositional tex textures, more importantly. So there is a crossover and uh, we are going to discuss a little bit more in detail uh, the uh, differences really that exist in a variety of sedimentary rocks. So the class will be a function of the size fraction, so the percentage of gravel, sand and mud that is contained in a sedimentary rock, but this is only one of the textural aspects really we have also to deal with color so interpret color which is a good indicator for example of the amount of organic matter that is contained in in a sedimentary rock or the level of oxidation and weathering that the rock rock has witnessed as well as other factors such as the uh, differences in mineralogy really so this is really important. Color is key. Remember to describe color when, when we discuss the rocks together during your examination, as well as mentioning any kind of structure really you can recognize in a sedimentary rock. The most obvious, if you remember from the lecture, uh, is really the stratification that we often recognize in sedimentary rocks, uh, which is so distinctive. So the fact that you have a parallel layering in a sedimentary rock is certainly an indication of the genetic process that led to the formation of the rock. Other features that are pertaining to structure are certainly the level of maturity of a sediment. So the clust roundness in this case and the clust shape more generally will represent key aspects as well as the presence of fossils which are strict, strictly linked to the environment of formation of, of a particular rock. We said size fraction, the other aspect is certainly the level of sorting, so well sorted rocks usually will be rocks that are in an environment that favors the uh, maturity and maturation of a sedimentar uh, of a sediment load and uh, i think also the fact that, that you have a poorly sorted assemblage it's also a good indication that the sediment didn't really move a lot so there was 
little transport which is commonly uh, represented by poorly sorted assemblage and usually very angular assemblages as well. So important distinction here that tells us about the history. So the history in terms of transport is certainly a critical component of the interpretation of sedimentary rocks and plays a significant role when we are trying to classify uh, the rock because specific rock types uh, will form in specific environments so, so we think about uh, uh, deep abyssal plains uh, where we have turbidites with bauma sequences for instance um, those will be characteristics of very drystal marine environments uh, and so from the texture of a rock and its uh, larger scale features such as particular type of sequences uh, so stratigraphic sequences specifically will be definitely useful to understand where you are with respect to an hydrological system or a marine setting composition lastly is a key aspect that defines the clan name and composition usually is really related uh, to uh, the environment of formation again usually it's a competition between uh, the carbonatic uh, or car carbonate supply more correctly and uh, also the terrigenous supply as well as the siliciclastic supply and this will be uh, as we discussed a uh, fun function really of uh, the transport uh, as well as a uh, function of uh, the uh, combination of uh, weathering as well as other processes such as allochemical uh, the precipitation of, of uh, biogenic material so these are factors that influence really the composition and uh, the type of grains that uh, constitute a sedimentary rock if we move on, we have really two parts to keep in mind and we, we need to describe the texture and understand the composition of a rock. So remember to describe the color, the interbedding, so the bedding thickness, the structure intended uh, with the shape of the class, for example, as well as the type of bedding. So if you have cross lamination, it's important to report that size sorting are other aspects that again are critical and the composition will be commonly class versus cement so understanding differences that may exist between the cement that glues the rock together remember from the lecture we mentioned that cements are actually material that tend to contribute to the lithification process during diagenesis uh, and then you have uh, the class that uh, will be rather influenced by the level of transport uh, so an example would be you know gray thin plain laminated uh, and moderately well sorted sandy claystone so lots of terms here that I uh, recommend you review and, and research uh, using internet to understand what each term really mean so we could pick for example laminated which is usually a keyword that uh, stands uh, for relatively thin beds so less than a centimeter quite often so laminated bedding is typical of shales and claystones uh, uh, rocks that are extremely fissile tend to form uh, this type of rhythmic bedding and this is quite commonly as uh, discussed in the lab uh, function of the environment of formation if you have a lot of cyclicity like in a lake with uh, tidal pro tidal related uh, cycles that are relatively small and seasonal you will end up with a very uh, consistent and repeated laminates uh, in your sediments and, and ultimately in your shales or mudstones or claystones like in this example 
Composition, of course, will be uh, variable. So we have chloritic, fossiliferous, arcosic. Uh, all these terms will be examined in this lecture a little bit further. Um, another important uh, concept, uh, uh, I think it's, it's really related to the sorting and uh, often if we look at a stratigraphic sequence like uh, this example here, uh, we can recognize uh, a pattern which is commonly defined as a normal grading. And this is, uh, has to be interpreted as the result of, uh, for example, a mudslide or uh, uh, a turbidetic flow or uh, usually uh, when you form alluvial funds, quite often you tend to have uh, that the first um, fraction will be relatively coarse uh, and subsequently you tend to have a depositional process that is rather uh, weaker in terms of energy and because of that uh, it tends to deposit uh, uh, finer fractions. And this process will be dynamically slowing down and as a consequence of that uh, you tend to have uh, as a result a fining up sequence. So you get very fine material at the top of the sequence and at the bottom the coarser fraction really. So the gravelly fraction will be at the bottom then you have more of a, of a silty and clay uh, sort of facies forming at the top, which is really what we, we can see in these repeated levels. Um, so we have strata that are relatively coarse. I can recognize small fragments and class in some of these intervals, so the darker ones. And then you have abrupt sort of changes with a fining up sequence uh, in which you can clearly see a much finer grain material which is seems to be calcareous but it could be also siliciclastic in composition or a mixture of, of these really. Uh, so remember in some cases this process will be relatively gradual so you will be able to recognize a fining up sequence quite easily and this is quite commonly for, especially for fluvial settings, uh, is uh, a good indication that you didn't have any overturning in these rocks. Uh, and so these are essentially lying in their original position. Uh, so you can establish uh, by looking at the grading, uh, the yanking direction of a package of strata. And in this particular case, uh, you know, that would be normal grading and as a consequence of that the younger strata would be at the top, really. Another important concept is sorting. Poorly sorted sandstones uh, will be represented by a variety of granulometries. So large clusters versus smaller clusters uh, and quite often class will be irregular in shape, so angular, well-rounded, or a combination, really, of things. Progressively, through the transport, mechanical abrasion will tend to uh, make the sandstone more well-sorted. So you will tend to separate fractions, uh, and so separate gravel, essentially, from sandstone. Uh, so you might have then conglomerates at the base and then a sequence that gets sort of uh, represented by uh, coarse fractions of sandstone and these will be all represented by grains that have pretty much the same size as in this example illustrated in here. So this is a function of transport of course uh, so for a short travel distance, uh, uh, when the flow rapidly uh, stops, like in a flash flooding case, uh, 
you tend to have this type of dumping and formation of a variety of fractions mix mixed together. Further downstream, usually the most big particles are left behind and you get a more uniform grain size. Another factor that indicates the level of, of maturity is rounding because rounding which is essentially the smoothing of angular class and as a result the formation of pebbles that are relatively rounded or pseudo spherical or elliptical in some cases it will be essentially a function really of, of the amount of transport that has witnessed a particular sediment load Grains typically have sharp edges in corners when they are initially produced. So if you think uh, at a karstic product, uh, you, I'm thinking of breaches that are usually immature because they don't see any transport. So if you have the collapse of a cave, for example, you will end up with uh, uh, essentially a breccia, which is uh, basically the coarsest possible accumulation of sediment uh, so with very large boulders many times uh, in those instances those will be relatively angular and usually they are monomictic uh, or essentially have the same composition so in those instances everything is angular as sharp edges and it's an indication that little transport really occurred because in a cave you just have a major collapse and everything stops pretty much where it occurred instead you know if you have situations in which you have water transporting the sediment or wind reworking a sediment for a very long time like in the Sahara Desert in northern Africa when in those instances the sediment will be definitely finer grain and so we talk about millimeter scale grains or class uh, which are usually fairly consistent so very well sorted because of the wind reworking and also usually well rounded see here a diagram that explains visually exactly what i was mentioning so we talk about low sphericity for elliptical class versus high sphericity and we go from well rounded to very angular so this stuff will be the stuff that hasn't moved that much and this one has been really transported for kilometers uh, for example on on the nile so uh, the huge river or the mississippi river in the states uh, so these large fluvial systems after hundreds or thousands of kilometers you get this very well-rounded uh, material same represented here in this diagram why do we get elliptical uh, specimens or, or class well in, the, in that case it's usually a function of um, the precursor rock or the protolite so when you dismember a rock that is a stratified rock usually you end up with the chunks that will be relatively elongated and this produce pebbles for example that are relatively flat the ones that you like to you know play on the rivers and or on the lakes and test how many sort of times you can make it uh, uh, sort of skim on the water and uh, yeah that's that's the kind of of uh, well-rounded uh, with uh, low sphericity class uh, that uh, uh, are formed when you are dismembering a, a, a really well stratified sedimentary package here are some examples of what I was just mentioning sometimes uh, the currents um, on um, a river 
will rework and reorient uh, si systematically uh, these pebbles and cobblestones uh, and as a result you have a process called imbrication that uh, is quite commonly uh, used as an indication of the direction of a current uh, so you of course you have to think about uh, uh, the stability of the class uh, when they are moved by by the water so these grains usually have a platy shape uh, so the pressure of the water will act uh, uh, essentially reorganizing uh, the uh, geometry of the class uh, uh, because of this asymmetry really so the flattening usually gets verticalized and uh, uh, imbrication takes place and so you form a, a domino like structures which quite often is actually uh, inclined so as a, a slope uh, that is pointing in an opposite direction with respect to the direction of flow so that's how you can interpret it but again you can have very complicated patterns so you have to be careful especially in areas where you have uh, currents that tend to change over time for example in relationship to tidal processes so the cyclical or cyclicity of tidal processes in estuarios will definitely influence uh, the orientation of these uh, and, and these tend to form uh, sort of uh, islands quite often and oyster lenses um, so you can see here these imbricated pebbles in, in a cluster supported aggregate because these class are touching themselves uh, and uh, you can definitely see that uh, the direction of the current is opposite to the uh, direction of the slope of this class uh, so is essentially dipping on the opposite direction with respect to the current these are very similar examples this is matrix supported no touching allowed and this is imbricated pebbles that are uh, in a relatively quiet environment so you lose the systematic orientation so in a way you can use uh, uh, the fact that there is a bit more randomness in the orientation as an indication that you are really at uh, the end of an estuario where the currents tend to be uh, less pronounced because there is of course a slope that is much lower and so waters tend to be more flowing in in in, in a much at, at much slower pace or velocity here is another example that shows uh, the variety of uh, sedimentation really that takes place so in this particular case what is really relevant uh, is this bookshelf like structure which is an indication of uh, uh, a high energy environment so you have essentially a rip off uh, of uh, uh, mud cracks uh, so you tend to form those mud cracks that we discussed uh, during the lecture and uh, sometimes the po polygons get ripped off uh, especially if you have uh, uh, very abrupt events like hurricanes uh, and uh, you can clearly see a break here with a ch complete, complete change in stratigraphy some vertical structures contained in this top layer as well as down here uh, which uh, are essentially an indication of subaerial conditions so often these are termed birdside uh, birdside voids uh, and uh, they are really uh, the uh, related to weathering and uh, uh, the production of soil so usually soil will develop uh, when you are uh, in a relatively dry conditions uh, and uh, essentially subaerial conditions in which you get exposure and so weathering can take place uh, and uh, essentially start the production of of uh, a variety of things really 
but reworking of organic matter together with, uh, with watering will lead to the maturation of a soil horizon and, and this is well represented in some of these lower layers uh, which get sort of enriched in class uh, as well as some characteristic algal layers like this level here So that's another example of how the energy can really influence some of the textures that you will be observing in a sedimentary rock. This is another example of a surface of imbrication. It's commonly called Ostler lens uh, when you have isolated lenses that form uh, in uh, as bars develop. Uh, in, in a river system so if you have if you have um, a brided river system many times uh, the accumulation uh, on uh, sandbars uh, as well as uh, gravelly bars uh, will be uh, forming these characteristic imbrication patterns and so you term them ostler lenses Here is another important diagram. This is quite important, so important to remember uh, some of the key results in terms of granulometry, so grain size, uh, uh, to uh, help with the classification and definition of the clasts that compose a sedimentary rock. So we can quickly summarize this diagram and think in terms of millimeters so everything that is above the 2.6 centimeters or 256 millimeters is commonly called the boulder and then you have this transition from 256 to 64 millimeters uh, and also lower so down to 2 millimeters which be, will be pebbles cobbles uh, and then you have this medium grained uh, world between 2 and uh, 0062 that will be dominated by sand and sandstone so remember that sand is the loose sediments non consolidated and a sandstone is a lithified equivalent uh, the same is true for a cobble and a conglomerate uh, for example Remember, con conglomerate can have really a variety of grain sizes. Uh, it's not that conglomerate is composed exclusively by cobbles. You can have conglomerates that are entirely uh, represented by pebbles. Fine grain material will be down the 0062 limit uh, and usually half of that or a little bit more than half of that will be the result for the silt although this is one order of magnitude smaller because we have three zeros and so that will be your limit that separates the silt stones from the clay stones so again here we have shells and clay stone they are pretty much the same thing although the distinction is made because of the different bedding so clay, clay stone is usually more compact uh, and uh, it's a rock that uh, doesn't display as easily bedding as it's this is really diagnostic as well as the amount of organic matter quite often black shales are really represented uh, and they are famous for being a source rock on oil reservoirs so, so they con can contain quite a bit of petroleum. Same appear siltstone and mudstones, um, although this terminology is often used in different ways by geologists and engineers. Uh, sometimes uh, siltstone and, and shales are actually included under the mudstone terminology, but in this particular case, uh, siltstone and mudstone are, are interpreted as being slightly coarser if compared to shale and claystone 
here is you have some images that consolidate and, and show the textures for different grain sizes so clearly you can see the cobbles here and uh, sort of a cement that is finer grain so a variety really of granulometries as i was stating earlier that confirm that a conglomerate is really composed of boulders cobbles pebbles and even smaller fractions uh, uh, quite often uh, it's really the percentage of the cobbles or everything that is actually more than two millimeters that counts uh, uh, in terms of uh, sort of classifying this rock we will see that later sandstones you know you can see layering and you have this two millimeters boundary that is quite quite important so usually they go from two millimeters to one sixteenth of a millimeter and they will be relatively gritty and often you have this very distinct uh, bedding that forms uh, in, in sandy material silt stones uh, still quite gritty but not as gritty as uh, sandstones uh, uh, because of course we are going down with with the granulometry significantly until we reach clays uh, and we have this bedding here well represented by this staircase geometry and uh, the formation really of organic rich material that accumulate uh, often you form shell sequences uh, when you have paucity in the region of supply and so you tend to have uh, uh, rocks like radiolarites uh, that will form uh, extremely uh, silica rich rocks uh, that are extremely fine grain because they are allochemical so the majority of the oceans uh, in uh, deep abyssal plains contain extensive amounts of shell sequences um, this has importance uh, in terms of preservation of organic matter so algas uh, like diatomias will uh, be the primary material that becomes the organic material that then becomes fossil carbon or fossil uh, petroleum and so these are really uh, critical processes for uh, the production of these natural resources um, this is another classification that is based on two factors so the amount of sand uh, in the matrix uh, and usually the percentage of gravel so you have a little bit more terminology to learn uh, for example dynamic tight uh, and also breccia here these are terms that will be a function of these amount of sand as well as the amount of gravel that is uh, in the rock so everything is above two millimeters can be considered a gravel in general so rocks that have you know on the order of 50 or less percentage of sand and they are usually on the order of five to ten percent uh, enriched in gravel they will be termed a, a dynamic tight so a dynamic tight is essentially very similar to uh, a conglomerate or a breccia and this is depending on the angularity of the class so a breccia is angular conglomerate is well-rounded the class but yeah it's very similar so they share a field but it just is the percentage of gravel with respect to the matrix so these rocks are more muddy if you want and so you have more uh, rather than having class supported aggregates you have mud supported aggregates uh, and so you tend to call them dynamic tides uh, so they are essentially fairly immature uh, assemblages 
and because of that they have they are not really well sorted and so you get a lot of mud mixed with larger gravels uh, and this is a good way to call diamic tides uh, diamic tides in fact are often linked with the glacial processes so moranic processes which have really a mixture of fractions uh, because of the action of, of the ice um, so here are some some key summaries conglomerate must have more than 30 percent gravel we already mentioned that conglomerates can be class supported or matrix supported so that's important it's not that exclusively diamic tides will be matrix supported but certainly the proportion of matrix versus class is the critical factor for the classification so remember that 30% uh, but also remember this 10 to 30 for and also 5 to 10 for, for diamic tides specifically silts will be much finer in terms of uh, grain size so they usually have a much lower percentage uh, so clays and silts will be up here but they usually still have less than 30 percent in terms of uh, amount of of gravel so that 30 percent is really important basically so remember that number that is telling you or separating really the conglomerates and breaches from the other stuff which are your clay and seals your diamic tides and sandstones ultimately so here you have a bit of a definition the only real thing that you need to learn is this concept of erudite which is a rock that is composed of sharp and rounded fragments so the erudite is something that is in between a breccia and a conglomerate. Breccia is only angular, conglomerate is only rounded. So if you find a specimen that has both rounded and angular class, and you are struggling basically to name it because you cannot tell if it's a conglomerate or a breccia, you can call it a rudite. And the diamic tide, well, we are going back to that discussion we were having before. It's essentially a rock that has much less gravel so less than 30 percent but more than five percent and uh, yeah because of that uh, you will find that most of the gravelly stuff is suspended uh, in uh, uh, essentially a, a matrix that is either a mudstone or a sandstone depending on the level of maturity here is a good example of dynamic tide uh, so we see that it's a very massive rock it's really poorly sorted with large pebbly material and then you have a chloritic uh, uh, sort of mudstone uh, that is cemented uh, the class the class have a very similar composition they all look uh, pinkish to reddish and in fact you can recognize that they have a terrigenous origin so dismantling of a granitic complex uh, quite often lead to this uh, uh, sort of uh, class that have a granitic composition there is also a variety of class i can see some dark class in this rock uh, and some white class as well so it's again poorly sorted but also compositionally different uh, which really indicates minimal level of transport uh, uh, because of the level of angularity that I can still see in some of these class uh, that which appear to be also sedimentary in origin so there were protolites that were sedimentary protolites or metamorphic protolites uh, that were involved in, in, in this erosional process uh, so there are examples of weak stratification in this rock which are highlighted uh, with these arch red lines uh, so it's important to uh, identify stratification because it gives you an indication of the direction of flow that led to the formation of these 
dynamic data. Here are some examples of conglomerates. These are self-explanatory. You tend to have really well-rounded, uh, uh, in this case they look like uh, quartz uh, or highly siliceous cobblestones uh, uh, that uh, are deposited in a, in a sandbar likely and uh, gravelly bars as well. Uh, and so this is quite typical of uh, a fluvial setting, I would say. And yes, because of that, you tend to have that the, the regional component is dominated. So you have silsiclastic rocks really dominating. And because of that, the majority of the cement that is gluing together all the cobbles and boulders is really uh, silicic in composition. Of course, we would have to test this rock with the acid to confirm it. Uh, but because of uh, the origin of the class and, and the really typical environment, uh, uh, this is quite often devoid of, of carbonates because of the amount of transport. Really, if you rework a lot of these things on, on, on bars in, in a river system, you tend to have that the carbonates get really removed. Uh, and you are left with uh, extremely quartz rich uh, assemblages or silica rich assemblages. An example of a cluster supported aggregate here we could argue that the class have an area that is larger than 30 percent with respect to the total area of this specimen. So this is how you estimate the percentage. You look at the area of the class with respect to the total area of your specimen. And if it exceeds the 30%, uh, well, in that case, you call the rock either a conglomerate or a breccia or a rudite. Uh, but in this case, uh, since the class pretty much have the same level of rounding so they're fairly angular you can see this cuspated cluster so very pointy here and also these others so, so what we can definitely see uh, that these are very irregular there is not a good level of rounding because i form corners here i can see corners in some of these clusters, like this corner here and so because of that this is called a breccia and this is another example which is much more oxidized but the concept is the same but here you can see that the amount of cement is even lower because the class are almost touching themselves and in some cases they, they actually touch themselves so it's almost class supported I would say this breccia so important to describe the composition of the class we would have to test it but this could be actually a karst breccia so this will be carbonate so you can argue for for a karst breccia because it ten tends to develop uh, in response to solution collapse that occurs in carbonate sequences uh, because of the water circulation in uh, reservoirs uh, uh, that are formed within uh, limestone, limestone caves uh, and so often these will collapse uh, and lead to the accumulation of uh, sediment uh, that is pretty much of the same composition like this class here they all have the same color so we could infer they have fairly similar composition uh, but also they are very angular because they didn't see any major transport they just were precipitated uh, inside a cave uh, another example of a rudite so this is a leaf rudite because most of uh, the uh, class are actually well rounded and also angular as well uh, but they come from other pre-existing rocks so that's why they called leaf rudites uh, in this particular case we have greenish gray thick bedded massive class supported moderately well sorted and so on so very long terminology, but uh, in the end, uh, it's it's really a mixture of of 
angular and rounded class uh, uh, coming from uh, either metamorphic or sedimentary protolites uh, and forming this rudite because of, of the combination really of, of fragments that have as seen a different history of transport. Uh, the cement that is gluing together the aggregate is dominantly quartz, uh, which is expected uh, again because the majority of this assemblage comes from the dismantling or of an erosion orogeny likely so an uplifted region and so a lot of weathering and other processes will lead to like hydrolysis will lead to the dismembering of of the rock mass so this is a summary of this discussion we were having i leave you to sort of look at these details uh, but it's really driving you in the decision of you know assigning a name to a relatively coarse aggregate the only distinction i think that we didn't mention is this final part here for the classification of conglomerate which although i think it applies also to brechas so remember uh, an oligomic conglomerate or breccia will be uh, one that is composed by a single type of class in terms of composition so same composition of the class uh, instead a polymic breccia or conglomerate is commonly represented by class that have a different composition the same could be applied also to a rudite of course If we complicate things a little bit further and we devote ourselves to the study of finer fractions, so we leave the coarse gravelly stuff and we move into muds and, and sands, we have a variety of ternary diagrams that can guide us in assigning a name which often relates to the level of maturity of uh, these particular types of well, relatively well sorted uh, sediment loads so of, of course these are finer fractions uh, so we enter a phase in which uh, the sediment starts to be more well sorted uh, and so we have usually a classification in here that divides uh, sands from muds uh, and gravels so when we have non well sorted sediments uh, we can use this uh, uh, terminology that is a mixture really so we could for example call the rock that is on the top edge here a uh, mud or a gravelly mudstone or a mud, a mud gravel and the same is true for central assemblages that will be a combination of the three names essentially so muddy sandy gravel for example and so that's helpful you know it's important to really be able to describe the uh, granulometry variation in granulometry in, in a rock assemblage when you have situation in which you lose the gravel so you no longer have sediment that is exceeding the two millimeters uh, we enter into a field in which we have to distinguish sand from different types uh, of uh, um, finer fractions so clay stones uh, from mud stones and silt stones and so you can see here another sort of uh, uh, way of applying names so uh, in this case this could be a sandy claystone or a sandy mudstones uh, or a, a sand, relatively sandy siltstone so important to remember that you can combine names uh, when you are dealing with different fractions in terms of grain size when we move instead in this diagram we are looking at different compositions so we have 
different rock specimens that have been named differently depending on the composition. So what are the uh, different end members? We have feldspars, so this is very similar to what we had when we were discussing the classification of igneous rocks. So at the top you expect to have quartz, but what changes is this corner here which is represented by rock fragments. Uh, so lithic, the lithic component will be uh, important. And in fact, we use the lith terminology to strengthen the fact that we have a rock that contains a lot of lithic fragments. Uh, so similarly to what we discussed for the tooths classification, if you remember. So we have a bit a bit of a difference here, so we will talk about things like quartz arenides uh, when we have a lot of grains of quartz, so a relatively clean sandstone that doesn't have a lot of clays or feldspar, so a very mature sediment uh, is usually classified as a quartz arenide. Uh, so if you find a, a, an arenide or a sandstone that doesn't have really a lot of feldspar or lithic fragments, uh, well, you are in a situation uh, in which you can uh, say that the sandstone is really mature, well sorted, uh, and so you are dealing with a quartz arenite. Uh, uh. In other cases, uh, you will have uh, a sub arenite uh, when you are increasing the percentage of feldspar and, and lithic fragments. Uh. And so you have other members like arcos, so arcosic wakes, uh, arcosic lutites, which is again a terminology that is used to describe the grain size uh, as well as the composition. So level of or amount of mud that is present in the rock will, will be really driving this classification of wakes and lutites. We'll see that later. Uh, but yeah, if we limit at the first term, arcos, so arcosic rocks and, and an arcos will be a NAND member that is extremely rich in feldspar. So very poorly uh, sort of uh, transported, so not much transport, so lots of feldspar because feldspar is one of the first minerals to be instable and break down quite easily during transport. Uh, so if you have a lot of transport, you move up here for in the quartz arenite field. If you have little transport, it will be down here with arcosic material as well as the lithic, lithic uh, uh, either arenites, wakes or lutites uh, if they are very fine grain. Some enlargements of the terms because they were relatively small in the previous slides, so difficult to really understand but you can see here the example of the sandy gravel I was mentioning or muddy sandy gravel uh, which I, I've, I've already discussed so I leave you to revise some of this terminology which would, would help you when, when you are assessing a particular specimen. In reality it's very difficult macroscopically to investigate uh, the different fractions uh, so quite often you will rely on, on your sort of feeling when you touch the rock and, and so it's likely that you will be mostly classifying the rock based on the end members. Uh, same here for, for the previous classification, remember the proportions of clay versus silt uh, which is helpful uh, as well as uh, the other factor which is the amount of sand that is present. Uh, of course, the maturity is interpreted commonly as an indication of the location. So when you are on a delta, for example, you will tend to have lithic sandstones forming. So sandstone that contain quite a bit of rock fragments in it. When you are in an alluvial fan, so you are in at the beginning of, of uh, the weathering process uh, when you have initial drainage uh, and transport uh, 
you tend to have fast bar rich assemblages and so you form the arc causes and then you have beach shoals with very mature and clean sandstone so dominated by quartz grains and then when you go of course in a distal submarine fan you have a mixture of all those and so you end up with a gray wake which is essentially a matrix rich assemblage so you have a lot of fine gray material is present but also a combination of quartz, felspar and lithic fragments. So again, this is repeating the classification we were mentioning before. So arcosic material, felspar rich, lithic material, rock fragment rich and quartzites or actually, uh, yeah, quartz sandstones would be highly, highly enriched quartz do not use the term quartzite because quartzite is actually an indication of also the metamorphic equivalent um, okay so here you have an extension of the same diagram the compositional diagram of, i was mentioning before and we go from sand into mud so we take into consideration the grain size uh, when we move in this direction along the diagram so if you take these quartz, quartz rich sandstones uh, uh, you can go into quartz rich mudstones uh, uh, so you can form charts for example and, and that would be you know a lutite because of the relatively muddy composition so very fine grain composition so mudstones are on this side sandstone are on this side but the story doesn't change. You do have the arcosis and the lithic material, so the arenites will be either enriched in rock fragments, felspar or quartz, but the same is true for lutites. So the muddy rocks could be either dominated by rock fragments, felspar or, or quartz. And this is again a function of, of the level of maturity or the environmental um, setting where the rock has formed. Another important classification considers uh, the abundance of carbonate. So if we add carbonate in uh, the cement, uh, we tend to have uh, a different nomenclature. So we start to mention rocks that are muddy usually as limestones uh, when they have relatively high percentages of calcite in them if the clay is really abundant we maintain this mudstone terminology but if you have a mixture so 50 50 quite often you mention it as a marl stone so it's important to remember at least three terms uh, which will be a function of how much the rock is fizzing through hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid will uh, really help with this classification. So if it fizzes a lot, it's a limestone. If it fizzes really a little, it will be a marlstone. If it doesn't fizz, it's mudstone. Examples, let's review some of the specimens that we have in the lab hopefully they clarify some of the concepts i mentioned uh, and make you sort of more familiar with the approach in terms of describing these different rocks so, so of course we have the example of the mud cracks here which is indicative of surface so specifically an horizon that is drying out uh, in a flat plane so if you have very shallow waters in a lagunal setting, quite often we tend to develop mud cracks. So they're a good indicator of the sedimentary environment that we are dealing with. And it's also an indication of seasonality. So ephemeral lakes, for example, might develop these mud cracks. And so you have cycles, so the cyclicity, 
really is critical and it will lead to contraction cracks so when you are drying out the flat plane and this will lead to the formation of fragments of mud uh, that becomes uh, indicators of uh, younging as well so rip up class quite often will tell you uh, the direction of younging so they are important uh, textural features in sedimentary rocks a different type of cracks are the synergies cracks these are usually related to salt rich environments like playa lakes in these particular settings is the evaporation of salt or brines more correctly that let uh, leave salt in, in the rock or a high concentration of salts through evaporation constant evaporation of, of water uh, in this uh, again lake settings uh, uh, that will uh, lead to changes in volume often these changing in changes in volume are again uh, related to the hydration of salt and so you get different types of structure that are more sigmoidal and lensoidal so you tend to have these s-like features forming so or z-like z features so you get the z's or s's and usually these cracks tend to be um, thinner at the periphery so they form lensoidal shapes uh, which uh, make it easy to recognize and differentiate them uh, from the mud cracks so remember the infill is usually salt uh, and so uh, synergies cracks are really linked uh, to uh, salt rich environments uh, by salt i mean halides for example or sulfates uh, or uh, other potassium salts will lead to this type of texture Flasher bedding is another important sedimentary structure. Usually it's found in environments that have constant changes in flow direction. And so flasher beds are usually bidirectional because of that. You tend to see bedding patterns that are well evident and you form again lensoidal bodies that have a distinct stratification and they are usually represented by sandstone so you have sandy material that is inter, uh, interbedded uh, within more muddy material so a change a dramatic change in granulometry uh, and within the sandstone often you can recognize cross stratification which is well evident in this example here uh, this appears also to be chloritized because of the green that you see which le let you understand some of the mineralogy as well as the abundance of oxides um, so there is iron oxides in, in here so likely hematite and so there are phases that looks like they've been more oxidized and other that were more reduced uh, and this will be a function really of, of um, the uh, type of flow that was influencing the deposition of these sandy and muddy materials uh, another example here of interbedded Flasher structures, uh, so I won't spend much time on this, uh, uh, but certainly uh, uh, we can recognize a similar pattern with relatively fine grain material that is intervening other more coarser materials, so sandstones. And here you have a much more in depth description of this particular specimen. Other textures. Are rather a reflection of the effect of deformation and tectonism so some siltstones or sandstone will have the bedding that is disrupted before uh, they essentially lithify so sandy material can be reworked and uh, mobilized and also you might have fluids that are injected into 
a sandstone layer and they will inevitably lead to the watering structures that often are quite erratic like this example on the top here where you lose completely uh, the consistency of the bedding these other examples in here you have z shape folding which is an indication of shearing that is taking place in these layers uh, and uh, this appears to be an intrafolial structure which is an indication that is an early deformation and often uh, this type of deformation or kinking is quite often a response to earthquakes uh, so deformation that is related to seismites uh, often will uh, be represented by folding of this type Burrows are other type of textures that are rather biogenic in origin so often organisms like to live in the first few centimeters of uh, a mud so if you have a mud flat uh, on, on the seashore for example you might have bivalves or other uh, sort of organisms that commonly live in the neritic environment uh, that will tend to uh, form these cavities because they are actually moving within the unconsolidated mud uh, and, and this can get uh, uh, infilled by a variety of cements uh, and, and result in uh, very peculiar patterns that are definitely an indication of biogenic activity uh, so these are essentially excavations in the soil uh, or more correctly in the mud uh, that are uh, fossilized basically here is another example of, of, of a litrodite I think we mentioned that before and showed probably the same rock type so I won't spend really long time on this I can only indicate that this rudite is uh, related like uh, with with a flow process because I can definitely recognize some stratification in the orientation of the class and in this case is class supported uh, so this example is, is really a good indication that uh, you have uh, at least I think more than 40% or 50% of gravel in, in, in this rock The breccia with the angular class we mentioned it already so I won't spend much time either on this one I think it's very angular same composition so likely a karstic carbonate rich or dolomitic breccia really oh this is quite interesting we have grapple lines here so remember that some of the sedimentary rocks will include uh, biogenic material and some will be either uh, vegetation that is trapped uh, so carbon rich material can be trapped uh, in paleo beds in river systems uh, or in mar marine environments um, you will form you will find biogenic things uh, such as graptolites or crinoids uh, so essentially uh, all the biota that is typical of the neritic environment uh, will be trapped so you can form also relatively uh, we saw that specimen of coquina like rocks or rocks that are dominated by um, shells of bivalves those are also other biogenic rock that are quite unique and they are again an indication of a, a marine environment so quite often graptolites have an elongated body and uh, because of that they tend to isorient uh, with respect to currents uh, and so that's really a good indication of, of the flow direction as well and so they can can be used as flow indicators the same is true for for shells uh, if you look carefully at the iso orientation of shells uh, uh, like gasteropods uh, you can guess uh, the past uh, um, or paleo currents basically you can they are paleo current indicators more correctly 
Uh, so these organisms tend to be dark in color because of the carbon content, uh, and uh, uh, so they are usually carbonaceous, uh, and uh, uh, yes, they are found uh, in the outer shell for the slope, uh, uh, and, and they are sort of linked to these characteristic currents. Other things that are really essential in stratigraphy are the interpretation of unconformities. Uh, what is an unconformity? It's essentially a truncation that we observed in pre-existing bedding, uh, which is often sub subsequently um, trapped re really in, in the rock uh, because of a, a continuity on, on the sedimentary record that marks this discontinuity uh, so essentially you you can recognize the truncation in pre-existing older bedding that is then overlaid by other newer bedding uh, so that's how you identify a, an unconformity there are different types of unconformities but this is a little bit out of of the scope really of of this discussion so it's just important to, to understand the concept of cross bedding which is linked really to on the development of unconformities and uh, uh, i think uh, this is actually a pattern that is quite typical of high energy environments uh, where you tend to have uh, the currents uh, can scavenge some of the sediment and uh, essentially form these gullies and erosional features uh, other cases in which you, form, you form an unconformity will be when uh, you uplift uh, a complex uh, and so you, if you have sandy layers that uh, get exposed uh, you might develop erosional surfaces uh, that are related to weathering and then you have other deposition when you have uh, um, cyclicity that essentially uh, increase uh, the uh, amount of seawater and submerged pre-existing sub-aerial rocks um, so, so essentially there is a cyclicity and often unconformities are linked to this cyclicity of my marine environments um, uh, so these are commonly called transgressions and regressions so marine transgression implies uh, uh, that the sea water is rising and a regression is instead a case in which uh, we have that the sea water is uh, actually uh, falling so the sea water level will fall and we get exposure of sedimentary sequences some of the high energy features are well represented in these specimens um, we have two examples uh, really this example here so as we was stating in this case we have an indication of high energy which is represented by uh, the evidence of structures that are related to the uh, flow of uh, uh, in this case likely seawater in a, a lagoonal setting so we have shallow settings quite often have currents that uh, are um, Govern or controlled by tidal processes uh, and so they are cyclic and so you have uh, the direction of the flow will change periodically basically and this tends to form s s relatively symmetrical ripples um, so these are ripple marks um, and um, they will commonly form, form in sandstone uh, like this example here um, other features like this uh, usually are found in mud flats when they get exposed uh, and you have rain so they call the cold rain prints uh, so when when you have deposition uh, or actually when you have precipitations uh, so essentially rain that abuts on on the surface of of the mud flats uh, it will tend to form these uh, imprints uh, um, so this could, could be called actually a, a nicnofossil because it's actually a footprint really that is related to a physical process rather than 
than a biogenic process, uh, usually echinophoses are rather referring to dinosaurs. Uh, so, for example, the footprints of, of a dinosaur who would be really a, an echinophoses, but the, the concept is very similar. You have essentially casts that or casting that, that acts on the rock before litification, and these casts after litification they get preserved in these sedimentary layers. So, very interesting um, from the standpoint of understanding the environmental setting and understanding that this rock was or sediment was at some stage in a subaerial condition. Um, this is um, the, one of the specimens that we will look in the lab uh, as well. It's, it's uh, a shale, and so it does have that characteristic uh, laminated bedding. So these shales are highly fissile rocks, uh, so they develop extensive bedding. And uh, uh, what's the bedding is you know, thin to thick planar lamination. Uh, so these are... Uh, lamina that are on the order of a few millimeters really uh, I think you have a scale down here that gives you an indication so that's your centimeter so they are roughly half of a centimeter in, in size so very tiny so again lots of repetitions or lots of cycles uh, they can change uh, the amount of organic matter and so you will get lighter colored layers that have less organic matter and darker sort of layers uh, which will be dominated by organic matter instead so variation in oxidation state uh, could be a, a good factor in this case that controlled uh, some of the rhythmic layering that is observed in this particular specimen This is an example of uh, another finely laminated mudstone. You can see here a variety really of grain sizes. Uh, so this is more uh, top part is more silty and this other section of the rock is rather muddy. Uh, so you have a change in granulometry of uh, the sediment uh, there is quite a bit of silicification in this rock uh, so it looks really competent uh, probably it's been weakly metamorphosed uh, and this would express explain the uh, greenish color and the abundance of chlorite uh, as well as uh, uh, some other features uh, so for example the uh, crystallinity of the rock it's it's also a good indication often of, of the uh, level of metamorphism that uh, that was present this is outside of the scope uh, some of some of the metamorphic rocks have really weak metamorphism so you can still recognize the protolith uh, uh, which is the precursor rock and in this case i can still recognize the bedding really uh, that is all the laminae that are present in the rock uh, so I can still uh, define this as a sedimentary specimen sometimes the fossil content will be plants uh, so we'll see this specimen also in the lab uh, often you have remnants of uh, plants that are um, uh, essentially uh, represented by carbon so fossilized uh, or graphite rich uh, um, components uh, uh, which could be leaves uh, so in this case this large example here could be a plant leaf and this other is rather a stem so plant stems uh, looks really elongated often and um, they are sort of an indication of the environment of formation of the rock of course uh, because they come from uh, usually fluvial settings uh, and accumulate in, uh, uh, for example, in the paleo beds related to a meandering river. So that's probably summarizing here. Um, it's important often to test the rock for acid with acid to, to see whether there is any component of, of carbonate uh, 
and often you have rocks like this that uh, looks relatively gritty so they are sandy and they have some carbonate so we call them calcarenites uh, often here is an example this is not very good resolution but you can see the reddish pink color so very abundant uh, crystals of or fragments or class of feldspar and uh, that's your uh, characteristic uh, indication that you are dealing with uh, a relatively immature sediment in this case it's uh, an arenite uh, and uh, yeah it's likely a fluvial or deltaic setting because of the mixture of quartz feldspar and likely uh, lithic fragments as well an example of uh, a conglomerate uh, so we have a surface here this particularly enriched in gravels but you can see the composition is dominated by quartz uh, so very good uh, indication that this is relatively well sorted and mature sediment uh, and uh, it's forming this likely uh, fluvia conglomerate uh, although there is some stratification so you have to be careful with the interpretation really of this rock uh, so it's it seem, seemingly it seems that this uh, gravelly material is actually forming a, a restricted layer and then you have fining down sequence so you tend to have much finer fractions and more sandy material in the lower part of of this of course we don't know the young in direction of this specimen so the original orientation but this could be clearly interpreted as grading so i completed this lab on sedimentary rocks you have here some of the specimens that commonly are discussed uh, i think we didn't discuss crinoids so if you find specimens uh, that have discs uh, in them and they are calcarenitic so they fizz with acid uh, it's a good indication you are in an eritic environment or where you tend to have crinoids uh, so you can do some internet search and look up uh, crinoids to understand uh, their morphology uh, but yeah also this will be discussed in, in the lab we will examine most of these uh, specimens together in the virtual experience uh, and uh, try to understand and reiterate some of the concepts that i mentioned that are commonly used for the classification so remember to sum it up uh, we always look at the grain size and composition when we try to assign a name to a sedimentary rock and the grain size and composition usually are very helpful to understand the environment of formation as well as factors such as the nature of the class sometimes the class will be biogenic in origin and so they can give you a lot of insight on, on the location where this rock formed so for example if there are a lot of bivalves, well, it's likely that you are in an eritic setting uh, because it's where these organisms tend to live uh, and also die. And then the shells accumulate and the lithification processes will form limestones that contain uh, shells. So coquina-like rocks will form. I hope uh, this was informative. Uh, uh, if you have questions, please con contact me on my email and uh, I guess I'll see you in the labs uh, and also uh, in the uh, live lectures. Uh,